Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mars Hill Radio, a production of GodsProof.com. And now, here's your host, Jeff Sievertson. A lawyer once asked Jesus, Sir, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. God created us with the ability to think, to acquire knowledge, and to discern truth. God wants us to use our minds. Theologian Clark Pinnock said, The heart cannot delight in what the mind rejects is false. Just like the Mars Hill of old mentioned in Acts 17, I hope this can become a place where people of differing, differing viewpoints can come together to debate, discuss, question, and persuade one another, and to exercise their intellects, but to do so with humility and respect. In 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And that word meekness and fear can also be translated humility and respect. I understand that many do not believe as I do, so when I speak with others I need to be respectful of them. I don't have to agree with them, uh, nor accept their position, nor, uh, but I do of course have to be respectful. I know that I have grown more in my own faith by actually talking to people that do not believe as I do. They are able to see my own hypocrisy before I am. Uh, it's a healthy thing to question what you believe and to ask uh, or excuse me, to question if you really believe what you say you do. And Paul, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13.5, Examine yourself whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. For me as a Christian I must be absolutely certain that my faith in Jesus Christ is genuine and true, and I must be certain that what I believe is the truth. I think we all actually come to that place in life where we count the cost. In other words, is the thing that I believe in, is it the truth? In fact, in Luke chapter 14 Jesus called or excuse me Jesus talked about what it takes to be his disciple he compared it to a man who makes plans to build a house and to a man that is going to war he first must sit down and see if he has the resources to do these things because if he begins the work and finds out that he is short then he will suffer loss and be mocked Jesus concluded that teaching by saying so likewise whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath he cannot be my disciple so in other words, you must count the cost. Are you, willing, are you really willing to forsake it all for what you believe? That's a question we hope to find out here. Is it, through, it is through these types of discussions that the audience will get uh, the opportunity to hear opposing views and then decide who is correct and uh, kind of be like a judge and a jury. In 1 Corinthians 11, 19 and 18 and 19, when discussing divisions among the Christians in Corinth, Paul said, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Therefore, discussing opposing views is actually a healthy thing to do, not only for us as Christians, but for everyone. Therefore, we are here to talk, to debate, and to see if we believe, or excuse me, and to see if what we believe is the truth. So to get our discussion started, I have asked my guest to cover three main areas. The first is, what do you believe? Tell us about your spiritual journey. Talk about things like, what do you do to get to heaven or the afterlife if you believe in such a thing? The second thing is, why do you believe? In other words, if someone were to ask you why you believe, what would you tell them? What evidence would you point to, point to and say, that's why I believe? And the third area is, what is your view of Jesus, the Bible, Christians, Christianity, and so forth? And one more thing to add, if neither of us can answer a specific question for, from the other, this does not imply that there is no answer to be given. This is not a game of stump the chump. Uh, to give an answer of, I don't know, but let me find out, is actually a sufficient answer. This will prompt both of us to study further, and that's actually the, one of the points of this whole show, is to prompt us to continue to look deeper and look further. So having said that, my guest tonight is Devin Hunter. He was born in Columbus, Indiana, to his parents, Roger and Marion Hunter. He was raised a Mormon, taught about Jesus Christ and his restored gospel. He was baptized at eight years old at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Columbus. As a teen, uh, as a teen did not fully understand having a relationship with Jesus Christ or his atonement. After maturing to a point, he knew he needed more than his own natural abilities. He needed answers to life's questions that parents couldn't give. He wanted and needed personal revelation from our Father in Heaven. I needed to understand, he says, forgiveness and additional strength. From that came trust and know and to know more about his Savior and all that he has to offer and our families. Um, 
So with having said that, I'm now going to turn it over to Devin Hunter. So Devin, welcome to the show. Okay, <laughs> Our good. first show, actually. So. All right. <laughs> well, um, I guess to start off, um, I I would have to start by saying that uh, I believe Jesus Christ is is my personal Savior. Um, that was not. Uh, I mean, that was taught to me when I was young, but it uh, didn't really ring true until I got uh, got older. Um, I believe that we have a Father in Heaven that loves us and, and knows each of us. Um, let's, uh, I believe in the power of personal prayer and, and Scripture study, that those, that those opportunities can teach, us, uh, can teach us a lot about ourselves and help us through all of life's challenges, that our Father in Heaven didn't just send us here to struggle and flounder on our own, that He's available for our, you know, for our needs. Um, I believe there's a plan of salvation that we can can follow, and through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we can return to live with our Father in heaven. Um, and then we probably what we'll do is just uh, as you list these off later on, we'll go through and we'll talk about what is your plan of salvation okay. through the, through the uh, LDS Church, and 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 we'll kind of discuss the differences between the two. Didn't okay. interrupt, but go ahead. All right. Um, I believe in repentance; that sin is real; that uh, we uh, we all have a need of. You know, to repent of the things that we do wrong and learn from those things. Um, that uh, without repentance, we couldn't go back to live with our Father in heaven and in in heaven or in what yeah. I would refer to as the celestial kingdom. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm checking my notes here. Um, I believe that Satan is is real. I think I mentioned that earlier that he's real and necessary for this process of of learning. Um, you know learning right from wrong and, and being willing to choose at whatever cost what uh, what is right. I really liked your your introduction. That was the first time I'd I don't know, read that part of it, but that was... Uh, which part of that? Oh, the, the, the part about um, uh, learning and, and... Oh, growing and learning. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, and for our guests out there that are listening, we're still... <laughs> This is new for both of us, so we're still a little stumbling along. But uh, hopefully, as as time progresses, we'll pick up the pace here. I hope so, so, so forgive us if if we're a little boring at first, but we'll get better. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention that I believe I believe we're all missionaries that we uh, we all have a bit of a obligation to point to others towards what we believe is our Savior, what our what our opportunity for salvation is, and and to try to point towards point others towards Jesus Christ through our actions and and things. So like when you say missionaries, because most people know Mormons through the two guys walking down the street in a black suit right, right. on a bicycle or walking. So I, No, I, we're not all in that. I, I yeah. didn't serve a mission myself, but you know, I think that through our example and through our, our happiness and our struggles that, and, and you know, defeating those, you know, winning against some of our life struggles, that we can be an example to others how we got through those things and uh, now that's one question that. that's one question I wanted to ask I know that uh, the mission the missionaries they go out two by two right. and they're usually younger folks right. for like Protestants and Catholics and, and evangelicals they'll send out you know families right. that'll go into mission fields are there Mormon missionaries that go out into mission fields in say Africa and, and China and other places or is it just those the two sets that always go out no, um, actually, there can there can be sister missionaries that you know young young women that choose to go out and, and serve just as a regular mission. They have a little bit different rules, but yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, basically exactly the same thing for for all most parts. Um, elderly couple, you know, my parents would like to serve a mission when they uh, when they have the opportunity to one of these days. So yeah, you can, you know you can have a mission once you retire if you want to, or at any point in your life you can serve a mission. Oh, okay. Um, because yeah. my typical encounter is just the, the two young guys coming up. Oh yeah, that's the, by far the most most, uh, most common. I know, like with Jehovah, I'm sorry, yeah, most known about. Yeah, they're yeah. pretty obvious to most people. Yeah, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And I I know, like with for example, with Jehovah's Witnesses, it's usually a family that comes out. Right. Sometimes it's it's a father and son. Sometimes it's a carload that comes right. up. Right. So, so it's just different. So well, um, and, you know, my family was called on a mission when I was 12. Um, there was. Uh, the North Vernon ward down a little bit a little bit south of Columbus. My family was called to go on a mission down there and, and serve 
just to help try to get the scouting program going. Okay. And that what's the scouting program? Boy oh, Boy Scouts, Boy Scouts okay. of America. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and that's a big part of our not necessarily our religion, but our young men's program is is uses scouting. Okay. And I think that's a great program, by the way. I'm, yeah. I wouldn't want to say that's one of my beliefs, but it's yeah. Well, I was a, a scout. great program. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I made it to life. I didn't right. get to Eagle. Well, okay. So. I was an Eagle Scout. Pretty proud of that, but. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's still a good program. We, we, our family was called down there to serve as, you know, my dad is a scout master and, and different things, um, worked in that aspect. But, uh, um, and then after that, the ward boundaries were changed and our family just got kind of relocated into that, into that ward when I was, uh, when I was younger. You might explain what, what a ward is, because oh, most okay. people probably don't understand what a ward a is. Ward, um, you know, the, the church is all over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the LDS churches throughout the world and, the you know, they break that down into little segments that are, uh, you know, one of them would be called a stake, and that's like the, you know, central Indiana stake, and within the stake is multiple wards in each big city or whatever, and then um, within the wards you can have, um, you know, smaller groups uh, that would be called a branch, or if it's not quite enough people to make up a full ward, I think maybe requires like a hundred people, or enough men and women to you know, organize the, the whole place. You can have a branch okay. of the church. So that's what a ward is. It's just a So you have area. stakes, wards, and branches. Right, basically. Okay. I mean, it, it goes up higher than that also with bigger groups, but yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's the basics of it. So. Yeah, because there was, uh, across the, the way here from our house, uh, we used to have a bishop that was the right. bishop of, the, of Franklin. Right. And I think they actually combined two two wards into one building. Or at right. least I think yep. that's how they did it. And they had yep. one ward in the morning, one ward at night. Yeah, that's what we do in Columbus also. Now, are you assigned to a ward, or can you go to any ward? Well, you, oh, yeah, you can, you're free to go wherever you want. It's not required. But um, they, they like for you to stay within the boundaries that, that they set because that helps balance out the number of people in that area that can organize and, and help orchestrate the church and, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, if you get too many people say, I like this ward better than another, maybe you'll have a lot more people going to one than the other and yeah. it's just hard to balance it out that way so like for example the bishop over here uh is he in essence like a pastor like in a protestant church or he is he does he go through some sort of ordination process or yeah okay yeah and, and he's yeah i would say a lot like the pastor of of what most churches would call but yeah okay i'm a bishop okay so are, you're not a bishop though are, are you a bishop no, okay no, no. does a bishop also i think he actually works so does oh, yeah, a bishop absolutely. typically have a job? Oh yeah, they're full time, full time job, raise their family, and okay. and the the church is just something that you have to do, don't have to do, but that's something that you are willing to do. Yeah, um, as a calling. Yeah. Okay, and that, I was I was just curious yeah. about that. I'm so, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. But back, to, yeah, that's we're all missionaries because we all should be, you know, introduce people to our beliefs that lead essentially lead to our Savior Jesus Christ, and uh, um, I. Uh, I believe I also want definitely should mention this. I believe the Book of Mormon to be true, um, that Joseph Smith was a prophet, that he sought truth. You know, as as a young man, he was raised with questions about the the religions at that time and uh, didn't know what to do. And he found a, a scripture and told him that he should pray and ask, and that's what he did. Yeah, so, I, I had a couple of books that they that I actually have this here. Uh -huh. the, the Mormons they gave me. Yeah, I forgot all of my stuff, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. yeah, I I had read in here where it said that he he prayed and he he was and then he had and this is I guess the one thing I want to try to understand is because I read in here on one hand he saw the prophet Moroni, but then on another thing it says he saw the father and the son. Mm -hmm. So what did he see first, next, second, and well, um, that's that's in the in the beginning of the Book of Mormon. It talks about you know all that all the stuff that he saw there. So if you have any you know interest in that, read the the beginning of the Book of Mormon, and it uh, you know it's in there. Um, okay. But first, when he prayed, he, he went to a grove of trees, and uh, at that point, uh, you know, began to pray, and he saw Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ, and you know at that point they told him not to join any of the churches at the time. That uh, you know he would be given instructions at, at, at a different time, but at, at, to answer his question at that time, not to join any of the current churches. And this was back, I think it said 1823. 18, 18, 18, 18, yeah, 18, back 18, in eighteen twenty three. So from did he say was was that to imply that all churches in all the world or just in his region? Um, 
Well, I think I would say all churches in all the world, because if if there would have been any other answer, then he would have that gone, would be would what he would there. have received. Yeah. So did was there? I, when I was reading through the Book of Mormon, I didn't see anything or any of the introductory literature. How long had the, according to your belief, how long had the teaching been corrupt? Um, I think um, my understanding of that would be, and I, I am more than capable of being wrong. I hope everybody can understand that. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm in no way a, a teacher or, um, you know, a scholar in all this. I mean, I, I, I study a little, you know, moderately for my own needs. No. But uh, I would say that happened after all of the disciples of, of Jesus Christ were all killed. Um, at that point, the you know his church wasn't led by any of his direct, um, the people that he directed to lead the church. Okay. They were all killed and hadn't passed that authority down. So, you know, from, I'd say, 80 years after um so, so like Christ, maybe a generation after a generation after those disciples were killed off then at that point they his his doctrine come his complete doctrine um wasn't available anymore so i think it was john john was the last one he he right. they tried to boil him in oil they tried to kill him and finally they exiled him on the island of patmos and he uh, i think he wrote his the, the book of revelation around 95 a.d i'm not absolutely certain or maybe that was the time of his death. So it was within the first hundred years. So yeah. you're saying basically from from the year uh, 100 on up until 1823, so that's what, 1700 years, that there was not a true gospel according to the Book of Mormon. Complete, or according to your... I mean, complete, a, a complete, you know... Complete gospel. Complete direction. I okay. Mean, I don't think Christ himself guided the church at, from that point until Joseph Smith um, translated the Book of Mormon and brought all those principles back the way they okay. originally were. So, I guess we could pro probably we could just keep going through, and then we'll get uh, up to well, some more. Uh, I don't want to keep interrupting, but no, that's okay. Um, why don't uh, um, I believe I uh, wanted to mention in, in personal prayer and, and personal revelation about the the questions that we have in our lives. I mentioned that early, but um, you know that we all have that opportunity to pray and ask our Father in Heaven anything that we stand in need of and that He can bless us with those, uh, you know, the things that we need in our in our lives. And answers can come through the Holy Ghost that, you know, the Godhead consists of, of three individual beings. Um, and that's, you know, Jesus Christ, our Father in Heaven, um, and, and the Holy Ghost, which is a, a spirit that can communicate with us through, you know, our feelings and bring things to our remembrance or you know, back, so that's the that's yeah, the, the Godhead. Yeah. But we all have that opportunity to pray and and receive answers to our prayers. Okay. Is there anything I, else? I think that's I think that's the things I wanted to to really hit on. Okay. Now that covers that starts to cover what you believe. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you believe? Uh, why do I believe? I would say um, my beliefs all started when I was you know I was raised you know in in the Mormon religion and as a as a Latter Day Saint. Um, and that started my beliefs, but you know, when I got a little older, I, I had to start questioning those beliefs, and at that point is where I really gained a testimony of prayer. And uh, you know, so I had to pray and, and ask if that stuff was was really what was right for me. And, and at that point, it didn't take long to to feel the Spirit, feel the promptings of the Holy Ghost, and say, "Yeah, this is this is what was true." Yeah. You know? And uh, so, what were some of the questions that came up at that time in your life? Um, well, one of the questions that I think I wrote some notes down here. Um, one of the biggest questions that I that I started to have is if if everybody is required to be baptized, if that is essential, a key element in returning to heaven, mm -hmm. um, that you have to be baptized. And I I believe that there was that section in in um, history where people didn't even have the opportunity to be baptized. You know, the, the dark ages and things. Baptism wasn't even a, a a thought. Well, yeah. what what happens to those people? You know, I mean, I, if the, if it is true that I have a Father in Heaven and He knows all of us and He is, as in my feelings, a true Father, how can He let that happen to some of His children that they're just like, oh, sorry, you know, you're 
you're just out of luck. You didn't get this chance. So if you're not baptized, then you have to go to hell. And that just didn't make sense to me. Yeah. How any father could let one of their children just, just pass drop away. Off the earth and and according to you know my beliefs about Jesus Christ, I mean, he would search for lost sheep, you know, all those kind of ideas. Yeah. But uh, that, that couldn't be real. So either I had to say there is no God and he wouldn't let it, let that happen to his children, you know, or, you know, there has to be a provision made for those for those souls. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that was one of my first questions. And uh, What answer did you get? Well, um, you know, in, in our church we have um, temples. We have the opportunity to... Um, for baptism for the dead, and uh, um, I don't know what else I want to say about that. But but you know, there's there's provisions made even even after um, uh, um, even, even after um, death, we can we can still be you know have opportunities to to be taught, and that's that's part of the plan of salvation um, that I know we were going to want to talk about here. Yeah, I want to know because because like you you say. Let's say, for example, there was somebody evil in the the fourteen hundreds. He was just a mean sob. Right. And and you guys baptism. You guys baptize by proxy, isn't it? Is it right. like a baptism yeah, by right. proxy? Right. So what happens to him in the afterlife? Once he's baptized by proxy, what does happen to him? Well, in his case, nothing. It wouldn't do any good. He oh. did, he wouldn't accept it. Oh. Okay. He, he'd say, no, I I choose not to be baptized, and that's. You know, at that point, he's going to have the opportunity to, to know a little more than what we know here. He's going to have already died, yeah. and and he's going to say, "No, I don't want to. I don't want to accept baptism. I don't want to accept the name of Jesus Christ, even at this point in my existence. I still don't want to accept." So that. you're saying, once he crosses over after he dies, he's does he does he still have an opportunity after death to to accept? Yep. Okay. So if he says no, then he's not. How how would you know well, if you guys should or should not baptize for him? Um, you baptize. There's you just baptize for anybody that you that you can think of or that you know is is an ancestor of yours or that you know of, and then they still have the choice at that point. You're not forcing them to accept it. It's just making that if they want to accept Jesus Christ, they have that opportunity at that point, and that kind of backs up and takes over their. Um, not having the opportunity while they were on the earth. The 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 one question. I mean, there's there's tons of questions. Oh, I, I like. I understand. Yeah. I love hearing this. But um, if if why did God wait for 1,700 years? If if the doctrine was that corrupt, why didn't He start back again? Like you know, like 50 years or 70 years after that last apostle. Well, I I don't know. Um, Is that something that's taught in the Mormon Church or? It's something that I haven't asked. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, there's been so many other things that I could could research or could ask other yeah. than that that I haven't asked. That is, a, it's a very good question, and I don't, I don't have the answer to it. Um, yeah, that's. <laughs> if you check out my website, I, I ask questions after, for years, and I, yeah. I, I, I get this way. I get very inquisitive because, like you said, you know, how is it that God could allow so many people to 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 flounder and be gone after that long of a period of time? Now you found an answer. Of course, I would probably ask the same question, and I don't know how it was in your experience, but the church that I went to, they always looked at me as, oh, there's that guy that asks all those questions, and because they couldn't answer them for me. Right. And I know for myself, as I grew up in the church, I became disillusioned with a what lot of the stuff. Did you grow up in? We went to a Presbyterian church. Okay, Presbyterian. Yeah, we, they call us the Frozen Chosen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> very stoic. Very, you know, we sit there. You don't raise your hand and. You don't right. say hallelujah. If you hear a noise, it's probably because somebody coughed. Right. Okay. <laughs> I've never been in... in uh, been in other churches? In, well, I've been in other churches, and uh, but I've never been to a Presbyterian church. So. Yeah, Presbyterian. And uh, But as I was growing up, I, I was disillusioned with a lot of things. I couldn't get the answers. And when I got into high school and then on to college, uh, I really sowed my wild oats and just didn't really care much for church. And it wasn't until the birth of our first child that I started to ask all these questions again. Right. And uh, every time I would ask questions about scripture, about God, about proof, about evidence, something to substantiate it, because I was constantly told, well, Christianity is a blind faith. I thought, what do, you, what do you mean by blind faith? Well, you know, you just have to believe. And I thought, well, I don't live my normal life that way. Uh, I, I, When I was telling this story to somebody else and I was trying to explain what blind faith is, and at least from my perspective, I put it this way. I said, if I was 
here at home doing some chores around the house and then somebody comes up from off the street I don't know them I don't know where they came from I have no idea who they are but they say I see you have kids playing outside and I'm really good with kids um, I tell you what if you want to go run some errands I'll stay here and watch your kids for you a lot of people say I'm just wonderful with children if I was to say well sure yeah here's the keys to my house I'll be right back that's blind faith <laughs> that's believing something without anything to back it up and so for the longest time I I I hated that answer. I got tired of hearing that answer. Yeah, me too, yeah. And I even heard the answer of, well, you know, blessed are those who believe without seeing, Jeff. And I was that was basically the answer of saying, stop asking. And it wasn't until years later I actually studied that passage. That That's where Thomas was doubting what the apostles had seen. And they had come back and they said, we saw Christ, we saw this, you know, he's resurrected. And he said, look, until I see the nail prints in his hand and I can thrust my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe you guys. So in other words, he was saying, this I need proof. It's unbelievable that I can't, yeah. I can't participate in this. Yeah, he was like, this is just, I, look, I know I, we saw him while he was here. I saw him die on the cross. You guys say he's alive, but I need to personally see it. And then, of course, that's when Jesus steps into the room. He says, Thomas, here, put your hand here. Put your hand here. Do this and believe. And then he said, you have seen, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. And in the context, that whole context, it was kind of funny. That was the scripture that locked me up and prevented me from asking questions. But then when I really well, examined it, was saying, yeah, yeah. But when I really examined it, and it unlocked me to say, I can ask questions. I can ask for proof. Yep. I can ask for tangible evidence because God does not want me to walk around in unbelief. And of course, like just I read, uh, I think I read it uh, over there in, in Luke. I think it was chapter 14 where Jesus is telling people to count the cost. You know, there's a guy who, if he goes to build, maybe I didn't read it. There's if it, in, in Luke 14, Christ is talking to a group of people what it takes to be his disciple. And he gives two examples. He said, there's this one man who goes to build a house. You know, what man doesn't first sit down to make sure he has all the material, he has all the money, he has all the funds before he starts building? Because if he doesn't, then he'll look like a fool. Or what man first, before he goes to battle, doesn't check to make sure he has enough troops? Because if he has 10,000, but he's going to meet somebody that, say, has 20,000, then he's going to have to end up asking for terms of peace. He said, and then he goes on to say that, if you cannot forsake all things, then you cannot be my disciple indeed. And my question always to the Lord was, when I felt him pulling on me, was, can I really forsake everything for you? You know, how can I trust that you're the God of the Bible? Because I know there's many religions out there. Yeah. There's many different ones out there. So versions how versions of each one. Yeah. yeah, there's different versions of each one. And they have similarities, but there are some vast differences with respect to how do you get to heaven. And that was my biggest question. And I, it took me several years of examining, and now I'm to the point where I feel that I can stake my entire, entire eternal existence on Christ. That's where I stand today. It took me a long time to get there. Some people just have a simple faith and they can believe. And it's like my wife. Uh, she says, it says that I believe it. She says she needs some proof, but not as much as I need proof. Uh, and I even rem remember reading the book by Lee Strobel. Uh, I think it was called The Case for Faith or The Case for Christ. And he went through and he examined all these different areas because he was an atheist. Mm -hmm. He just hated religion, despised it and all that stuff. So he began to examine the scriptures through experts and asking them questions because he was a professional journalist and it took him a long time until he finally received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior it was the evidence that did it for him but then when his daughter saw the change in his life seeing his changed life well, prompted did. her to come yeah. to Christ so he was a missionary yeah he was in a sense he became as a missionary to his own family and so um, that's one of the things that I whenever I examined other uh, religions was to constantly dig in and look to see what do they look to with respect to proof to, to prove these things right. so uh, other than what you've all... answered before what what are some other things that are you're, you're getting ready to say something I'm well, sorry no, no, that's okay you, you're doing good I I think everybody is different in that some people yeah. need more proof than others yeah and for me I have sufficient proof and we can talk about what that is but where I don't have proof I've got enough proof that makes me firm in that my the feelings that I get from the you know through the Holy Ghost and through prayer and through the ideas that come to my mind when I read the scriptures, Bible and Book of Mormon, not just that I'm Mormon, I only believe in the Book of Mormon because I, I mean, the Bible is is 
just as as important. Yeah, as let's talk when you're was. done. But let's talk about that. Yeah. Right, but when I, as far as when it comes to needing proof, um, you know, the feelings that I have are proof enough for me, and I think you know that's not always the case with everybody. We're all different like that. So. Yeah, there was a card that uh, the elders had given to me. And when I, for the folks here at home, uh, elders are referring to the missionaries. They're they're known as elders, correct? Right. Okay. Yep. The elders gave me a card here, and I've heard this before because you know we were talking about other books, because uh, it's for for Mormons. It's not just the Book of Mormon. It's it's the King James Bible, right. the Book of Mormon. I think you have Pearl of Great Price, and Doctrine, Doctrine and Covenants. Covenances, and the Journal of Discourses is another one, isn't it? I, yeah. Is that considered a holy book, or is that just like I think it's comments? Just, I think it's just comments and, and things like that, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, there's a little postcard they gave me. It's called the Articles of Faith. And I've heard this phrase before, and I wanted to ask you about it. This is number eight. It says, we believe in the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. So that phrase, as far as it is translated correctly, what does that mean when, when you hear that well I that means that I think you and I talked previously about this that you know throughout all the generations of um, you know that that the Bible was was used and, and translated so many times and I think at, at certain times um, and I don't have examples of it but it makes sense to me that you know the scriptures a few words could have just been changed in in translation that means something totally different and and I would say one example of that is, you know, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And in our understanding, you know, killing, you can kill a plant, you can kill a, a bird, you can kill a lot of it, you can kill a person. And I think in an original translation, that would have meant thou shalt not murder or take take life innocent, take innocent life. And, you know, that that isn't a teaching that I would, you know, say I've, I've um, but that's my understanding of it, you know, that those kind of things can happen and as long as it's translated accurately then yeah the book of mormon or i mean the the bible is you know perfectly true and it is it's absolutely correct and that's the words we should live by by our you know through our savior and and, and our father in heaven both but it's got to be right there was a there was a group of scholars that it was referred to as the jesus seminar and they sat down and they went through all the passages that re referred to christ speaking and they would use these various beads and they would say the likelihood of Jesus saying this, the likelihood of him not saying this, or that he never said it at all. And they actually, apparently there's a color-coded Bible that you can read and you can, you know, there's margins that say, right. yeah, he did, no, he didn't. Is there uh, a King James Bible that uh, that is published by the Book of Mormons that has highlighted passages that say this is properly translated, this is not properly translated, this was lost, this is... Anything like that? There, there are some in in the in the footnotes of the King James version of the Bible. There are some, you know, word differences that that you know they'll highlight. They'll say actually this meant a, a slightly different version of the word that might make uh, to me doesn't usually make any difference that, in my understanding. But I think to people that really studied a lot further in depth, it might make a difference if they yeah. know more about you know old languages and things like that. But yeah, for the most part, I think the King James. Well, I know the King James version is is the version that we, um, I don't know, accept. Yeah. Um, well, when you when you guys have uh, when your bishop quotes from your scriptures, uh, or when he uh, exhorts you or, or is expounding upon the word, where oftentimes do they go? Is it spread across no, these books, it, or is it concentrated no, in one? It's definitely not concentrated in any. They would all be used equally, I and mean, I think it just depends on what the what the topic is and um, something that I'd like to uh, address a little bit you said when the bishop is you know talking to us and he's not the one that oh, okay see, I didn't know that no in in a typical sacrament meeting that what we call a sacrament where the whole congregation is gathered um, the the bishop and he will have two counselors that you know help him do whatever he's needing done um, they'll ask members to prepare a lesson or they you know, there's places on the internet, books they can use that they can actually kind of teach themselves. And they say, okay, this, you know, I found these things in the in the scriptures, and these are, this is what it says. This is, you know, how that is applied in my life. And you know, and we call those talks in our, you know, oh, okay. in, in the sacraments. You know, Devin Hunter's asked been asked to give a talk on, you know, whatever. Yeah. And you know, so you would 
you know, a lot of it would be more personal as far as how you would apply lessons from the scriptures, how they've affected you. We also, the first, um, the first Sunday of every month, we would have we would have what we call fast and testimony meeting, which is um, you would fast for you know one day prior to that, um, you know, starting at lunch on Saturday, and you fast till lunch on Sunday. But in our sacrament meeting that day, we all you know we have a testimony meeting where anyone from the congregation can get up get a microphone or you know go up to the podium and bear their testimony the things that they know to be true the things that they um, have recently learned the things that they've have had recently had to struggle with um, and that's for the purpose of just strengthening one another as as members so we all know that we're all kind of still in the same battle and we're still you know having the same struggles I guess yeah so it's, it's I, I really enjoy our our fast and testimony meetings so and that that's on a Sunday morning. That's on that's on the first Sunday of the month. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's and interesting. So you were just talking about the bishop yeah. teaching. Yeah, because he's I'm... not the only one that teaches at all. I mean, oh, okay. Kinda... So what are the duties of the bishop? Um, presiding over the members of the church, which he he, uh, um, it, it's in the Book of Mormon. There's a section in there. I wish I could. I wish I knew exactly where it was. I don't. But um, I think my understanding, without actually reading it right now, would be that he. He presides over the members of the ward, um, especially the elderly and the the ki- the, the youth. Um, now, the elders' quorum, which is basically all the the men in the ward, um, you know, they're responsible for the families. You know, mm-hmm. they they're assigned families that they go out and and visit in their homes, make sure their needs are being met, and that everything's going well. And uh, but yeah, the bishop, I think, is primarily just oversees everything in the ward and. Especially the elderly and the, the kids. Okay, it's actually a good question. I need to study back up on that. But anyhow. yeah, because I mean, uh, the the bishop that was over here, I, I knew he had a regular job, but I I never took the time to ask him all these kind of questions because right. uh, just we're just busy and, and so forth. Uh, what I would like to ask more about is how do you get to heaven from the Mormon's perspective? Well, um, that is what we would refer to as the plan of salvation, which is. One of the things in our, in you know in my faith that really just rings true to me. Um, basically, the plan of salvation. If you have questions, you can look it up on the internet. Um, you know, ask the missionaries to come and could discuss it in detail with you. But basically, the plan of salvation is we all existed in heaven with our heavenly parents um, there. We came to earth to receive a physical body to suffer the challenges of of physical life and had make a choice you know whether we would follow our father in heaven's commandments or not um, after death when we're not dead our spirits leave our body the body stays here on earth um, spirits go to a uh, place to wait and learn more um, oh really what, what do you like like the Catholics have purgatory where they go and they burn off their sin but you, you have a place where you go and learn at that point that you know that's Waiting, those people are waiting for judgment and for um, the second coming, which at that point everyone will be resurrected. Um, and then, um, you know, and, and after you're resurrected, will be a judgment. And then the judgment will, everyone will be given the opportunity to go to whatever of the three kingdoms or, or levels of glory that you, I don't know, I should say belong in or um, have achieved. That's... Okay, and the highest would be the celestial kingdom, and then the telestial kingdom, and the terrestrial kingdom. Now, the thing about that that I always really just made so much sense to me is I, you know, going back to my original argument is what would how would our Father in Heaven just dismiss some of us? And I would, I would, the reason that this three kingdoms after um, after we're resurrected make, makes so much sense is that as a father. I could never, under any circumstances, tell any of my kids, no matter what their behavior was, that you know, I'm, I'm done with you. I don't. I, you can't be around me anymore. And I couldn't imagine my father in heaven, who's I believe would be so full of love. How could he do that to me? Also, yeah. you know. So he gives us opportunity, just like a, I think is understandable. You, know, you give your kids opportunities to do what you say is right and what you want for them to do, but you can't make them do that you've got to give them a choice i think choice is essential in this plan of salvation it's what we call free agency mm-hmm. um i know i'm not doing a very good job explaining this no you're doing fine anyhow um you know at, at no point 
in very few circumstances is anyone just damn <clears throat> you know you're just not you're not allowed you know to have any interaction with your father ever again you go to hell I can't imagine me so do you believe in a hell is there a hell there is um, what what we would refer to as outer darkness which is where Satan would be banished to and yeah. where, you know it's like I think outer darkness the best way to explain it is someone who has had a perfect knowledge or a nearly perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ and of all of those you know the Godhead and the Holy Ghost has, has confirmed to them that that you know what they're doing is wrong and they dismiss it and they choose to do it anyway yeah and I think that's very so just unbelievably few people would ever fall into that category I think Satan is one of them so like for example in the in the Bible uh, when it says when it re makes reference to hell it makes reference to those that uh, do not receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior go th to that place but you're saying that in from the, the Mormons perspective it's it's just an outer darkness that in those and those people are exceptionally evil or not even exceptionally evil that there are people that knew Jesus Christ was real had no doubt of it couldn't deny it but did anyway but did anyway. They had to know perfectly well, but deny it anyway. And that, I mean, because one of the things I was, I was, I, when, as I did read through the Book of Mormon, uh, it did mention hell quite often. Right. Is that this? So is that the same terminology as you're using with respect to outer darkness? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. So that was one of the things I found interesting that he made reference to that, and he made. I want to say he that when Joseph Smith wrote it, I know that. According to your your belief, uh, how many people wrote the Book of Mormon? How many different individuals? A bunch. I mean, oh, I'm going to say okay. twelve. I'm not. Some of them are mentioned. Wrote different books, but maybe not even. I don't know exactly how many. Okay. There's several books in there, but they some of them were were abridged by Moroni and and not necessarily written by Moroni. But um, yeah. I don't know. I should know that, but I don't. Yeah. Um. I lost my thought train of thought. <laughs> We're talking about hell. And, yeah, and about hell and so forth. And uh, for the folks at home, uh, I understand you have the three heavens. Um, one of the, the one of the phrases that I had heard, and I looked it up, and I found who it was. It was your fifth LDS president, Lorenzo Snow. Mm -hmm. He had coined a phrase, "As man is, God once was; as God is, man may become." And uh, I have some friends and family that are Mormon, and I. I wrote him several things asking the question about your God and, and what you believe and he said that was a that was a proper Mormon doctrine doctrinal tenet. He said he wasn't right. sure if Lorenzo Snow had written that, but he said yeah that reflects a, a Mormon doctrine. So are you saying that at one time Father God, as you describe him, was a man somewhere? Do you, where was that somewhere? I have no idea. Okay. Okay. So somewhere within the Cosmos, he was. I mean, he he could grow and 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 become a god of his own his own planets and yeah. Okay. And create his own family from that point on. I, in our church, the, one of the key elements in our in our church is family. Yeah. And uh, you know, if if I if I translate that back into um, you know my father in heaven is someone that knows me and and who I should follow and who um, you know is is willing to provide and help me at any any point. You know, my children can at some point become fathers also, and you know, and then they have their own kids. And I think it only makes sense that that would would continue. Um, One of the things I had asked him was, I, I wrote out a progression of of how your God went from wherever he was until he is today, and I put at the very beginning he was in a state of unknown existence, and he says that the the Mormon doctrine states that he was a, an intelligence. He wasn't a spirit baby, he wasn't a physical man, and he wasn't a god, but he was something in a different state. Are, are you, you heard of that? I don't know. Okay. Haven't heard that. So if, if, if that doctrine is true, if we, he's a god now, we back up, he was a man, we back up, he was a spirit baby, we back up, what was he before that? I don't know. No? Okay. Because one of the things that I, I found in the Book of Mormon, 
uh, and then I ask another person who was a Mormon, there are several passages in here that reflect what is written in Scripture about that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he is from eternity to eternity, that he has never changed. Uh, and there's even passages I had ran across, I don't know if I could look them up here, but indicated that he is the only God. And that was actually written in the Book of Mormon. Have you ever run across that in the Book of Mormon? I'm sure I have, but I didn't. I, that wasn't one of those things at that moment that I was looking for answers for and didn't, uh, didn't yeah. strike to me, didn't, didn't spark. Okay. Because one of the things, if I could find it again, um, yeah, it says for, this is First Nephi 10.18. This is out of the Nephi. Book of Mormon. Nephi. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Not sorry. Uh, Nephi. Let me pronounce that. First Nephi 10.18 says, For he, God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the same as spoken. Oh, I'm sorry. This is my notes. I had to hurt. Uh, this is actually the same scripture that's spoken of in Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Uh, M-O-S-I-A-H. How do you Mosiah. Spell? Mosiah. Okay. 3.5 three, uh, says, For behold, the time cometh and is not far distant, that with power the Lord omnipotent who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity. And there are several passages in the book, in, in, in the King James Bible, that uh, make reference to that, from everlasting to everlasting. Mm -hmm. And the way it describes the God of the Bible, uh, when I say the God of the Bible, I'm referring to the Holy Bible, Genesis to Revelation. The way it describes that God is one who ne neither had beginning nor ending and never changed state from, what, from one state to another. God the Father. Because mm -hmm. it says God is, is a spirit. And actually his name in Exodus 3.14 when Moses said, well, who do I say you are? He said, tell him I am that I am, which is basically the ever-present one, the unchanging one. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find where that said that. Uh... Uh, oh, there it is. Moroni, Moroni M O R O. Okay, Moroni eight eighteen. For I know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being, but He is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. And uh, uh, that also kind of matches up with Psalms one o two twenty seven. Right. But Thou art the same, and Thy years shall have no end. And Malachi three sixteen, which is the last book of the Old Testament. For I am the Lord, I change not. Neither ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So that's one of the, the questions I had as, as I was going through studying different religions. Um, I had read, like, example, the, the, the phrase that was said by Lorenzo Snow uh, and also Apostle Bruce McConkie. Uh, he said, those who gain eternal life receive salvation, they are gods. And Brigham Young, in the Journal of Discourse uh, 393, he said, the Lord created you and me for the purpose of becoming gods like himself. So I was kind of curious, when I read through the Book of Mormon, when they gave me the Book of Mormon, I was actually a bit surprised to find where they find had the said... the things in there, right. Well, to, no, to find what it says in Scripture, but then later on it says that God changes. Because that's what actually one of the questions I had asked uh, my friend. Let me see. He used a phrase, and I apologize, I should have... Oh, you're fine. I would be doing the same thing. Um, he said, yeah, he said... We believe God is, this is an, another friend of mine who's Mormon, he says, we believe God is a being that is an eternally progressing being. So what does that, what does that mean when one hand it says God doesn't change, but he's an eternally progressing? Hmm. I don't know, I have not, I have not, it's a good question, that, those are questions that I have, um, you know, have, have not needed to study at this, you know, up to, up to this point. No, that's fine. I, I think, yeah. I think, you know, with what I would have, all I would have to say with that is, you know, as we read the scriptures, we have things that we stand in need of, and, and the thoughts that our mind are dwelling on, where we're at in our own progression, are the things that that are meaningful as we read through the scriptures. Other things, as, as I read anyway. You know, I sometimes I'm just like, okay, this, this isn't meaning anything to me. This isn't. I'm, I'm just reading to be reading, but I'm, I'm not at a point where I'm really absorbing some of this stuff. And then other times, you just it, it really is it powerful, just jumps right out powerful at you. to you. Yeah. And you know, so the stuff that you've studied, you maybe you know, you're at a different point than where I've been. Yeah. And I also would say to that, to, in my defense, I I feel like not that we're arguing or anything. But no. But like I said in the beginning, if you don't have an answer, that doesn't mean there isn't an answer. Absolutely. It Absolutely. just means that you're you're just not unsure. You're just unsure at this time. Yeah. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I really, I mean, that, that you would even have that understanding that hey, yeah. we're not, we're not well, I mean, criticizing when, one another. When I started this, yeah, when I started 
in my own searching years ago, there were people who were very arrogant about their knowledge of the Bible, mm -hmm. and they would make me feel like a complete idiot because I didn't know what they knew. Right. And I'm thinking, why are you bashing me? I'm I'm at the beginning I'm of my here. yeah I'm yeah, learning. I'm, I'm at the beginning of my journey. Help me out if you care about me. Help yeah. me out here. Yeah, don't make me feel like an idiot. Right. And I I've, I've sat in Bible studies where the, the Bible study teacher would basically belittle you if you didn't know. Yeah. You know, in, and so everybody kept quiet. They never asked a question because they knew if I ask a question, he's going to make me look like a fool. Yeah. And I don't want to look like a fool. I'm shutting up. <laughs> I'm shutting up. <laughs> and and uh, that's one of the things I encourage because I teach uh, a Bible study class. We're teaching the book of Genesis at uh, Southside Bible where I go. Right. And we're, we're only up to chapter 11, and it's been over a year and a half almost. So it's a lot of study. It's, it's a lot of well, <laughs> it's a lot of discussion too. Right. Because I I tend to encourage people to talk and to ask questions and to really dig in. Because what's the point of getting into the book if you get nothing out of it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I even heard somebody say it's not about getting into the Bible. It's getting out of it. It's getting or, excuse me. It's not getting out of it. It's what you get. In, it's getting into it. It's what you learn from it. Right. So it's no, how I'm, you apply that to your life. And yeah. That's, that's what I was you know intending by that is. The things that I want to apply to my life and the questions that you're asking about the Godhead and about, you know, the progression of, of our eternal Father in Heaven, yeah. I I just haven't got to the point of asking. There's so many other things that I've had questions about that I haven't even got there. I yeah. guess my, my response to that would be, um, you know, that the things he's talked about, we're on... Um, I know I, well, the scripture just left me there, but, um, you know, how... God's ways are higher than man's ways, and there's, I think, within our limited capability to understand um, a lot of that kind of stuff, he's put it in as simple terms as he can, and we can debate those um, eternal, infinite ideas, and I just don't even think that I'm capable of understanding a lot of that stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I wish I was, but at this point, I'm just not, and I don't know that, that a lot of people are. I mean, it's it's a good stumbling block, yeah. um, if, if that's what we're looking for. I know, I know we're not, but... If you're looking for a reason to just stumble, that's just go for the biggest, most complex theory you can think of, and and you can definitely stumble on those things. But there's so many other simple things that that you know we could just really work on and, and apply those things to our lives. Well, I know for I can say from my perspective of studying scripture, uh, and I can't remember the passage of scripture, but the essence of what the passage says that if you study five pounds, you'll get twenty. In other words, if you have a true heart's desire to know the Scriptures, the Lord will give you understanding and insight. Right. Uh, but if you have no desire to know the Word of God at all, He'll actually put a veil in front of your eyes so you don't even understand it. Uh, and so as I began to seek... <laughs> Wait a second, that sounds like a lot... I've, I've experienced that sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I was like, I don't understand this at all. But it yeah, mean anything to me. He will, okay. he will darken the mind of people who, who have no desire whatsoever to know the Word of God. And I get, and this is one of the things I get into when talking with other folks. They say, "Well, your Bible has contradictions everywhere." I'll say, "Well, point out one to me." Well, you know, there was that one king. Uh, it said that he he would go be taken into the land of captivity, but then another scripture says that he wouldn't even see it. So how can that be true? I said, "Well, you got to find the one scripture that says his eyes were poked out, and then he was taken into captivity." They're like, well, you know, there's other contradictions. Well, like what? Well, who was Cain's wife? Well, according to Scripture, it says that Adam had many sons and daughters. Well, Cain, you know, married his sister. You know, today we think, oh, that's gross. But back then, who's going to... Didn't have an option. <laughs> he didn't have an option. <laughs> and, and who's going to arrest him? Right. <laughs> so, and, and, and there's another place where the Scripture says that the word is a, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I didn't really quite understand that until I studied Scripture to where you'll, there, Scripture is written in such a manner that, that ideas and concepts are kind of separated and spread out. And so to get a clear picture, you have, to, have, to, stu you have yeah. to study the whole thing. But if you're somebody who has no desire to know the Word of God, it's spread out in such a manner that if you read it, you'll find apparent contradictions. And that's one of the interesting things about, like when Jesus said, well, who do people say that I am? And they were throwing out all kinds of things. Well, people say this, people say this. Well, the funny thing is, you know, the Bible says that he was to be a Nazarene, but he was to be born in Bethlehem, but he would come out of Egypt. It's like, how does that all fit together? Well, it doesn't come together until you read the story and you understand that, you know, he was born in Bethlehem, 
because of a, a taxation that was put upon him. He came out of Egypt because they fled to Egypt out of fear of what Herod was going to do. And then when they came back, they settled in Nazareth. So he was known as a Nazarene. So, but somebody who reads just those little bits mm -hmm. and pieces, they think it's contradictory. Yeah. Yeah, this, this has all got to be false, right? Yeah. So the, the scripture, and I think there's a passage that says, here a little, there a little, uh, precept upon precept, line upon line, is how the scriptures are built. Because it will discern your thoughts and intents. Mm -hmm. And for those that want to know the Word of God, I know for like for myself, those apparent contradictions drove me further and deeper to find the answer, mm -hmm. because I know there's an answer, and I can say that everything so far, every question I've had, the Lord has answered, and so that's why I'm when I come across the Book of Mormon, and uh, and I've asked the elders these kind of questions too, because like I said in the beginning, I think it's a healthy thing to question. I think it's a healthy thing to examine your own religious belief, what you grew up in, what you were taught, uh, what you came to believe, and ask those critical questions because the thing is is that if you get to the end of this life, and we talked about this earlier, uh, not on the show, but earlier, uh, that when you get to the end of this life, if you were following the wrong thing, how, you're devastating, gonna, would that be? how devastating would that thing be? And I notice people will spend more time on their financial portfolios, They'll spend more time on their house, more time on the, their landscaping, more time on earning money to go on fabulous vacations. They'll spend more time on the temporal things than they will on the eternal things. And I think that this is such an important question that everybody should ask that for me this is in essence my hobby. This is, this is my desire to know the Word of God and to know it deeper and to teach it to others. And one of, I didn't mention this in the beginning of the show, my desire is that everybody come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, according to the scriptures and uh, so I'm not going to make any bones about it but I'm still willing to talk to folks like yourself who we have differences of opinion different belief systems uh, because I think we're all on this journey to figure out the truth yeah. now I fi think I figured it out but <laughs> but somebody else could come in and tell me you're completely wrong and here's why well okay tell me why I'm wrong and let's let's look at that right so anyway well, I, uh, I, you know, that this the scripture that you're referring to about, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept is, is I think very important to all of us, and we, you know, we're all on that, like you were saying, like all, we're all on that journey, we're all learning together, yeah. and uh, you know that's very important. Well, um, yeah. I, I really respect that about you, Jeff. I mean, we're good <laughs> friends, and I, yeah. I admire that zeal, that interest in learning and, and knowing for yourself. That's a characteristic yeah. I wish so many more people had. I, I, I had it more. I think a lot of people would prefer I get on Riddle and, and just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <no. laughs> Some people maybe. Yeah. Because I would ask even crazy questions. I'd say, well, what about UFOs? What about aliens? What about them? How do they fit into the Bible? they got to fit, right? If your right. Bible's true, how do they fit? Right, where do they come from? And they're like, just shut up and go take communion. <laughs> 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 We're yeah. trying to pass the plate here. Stop talking. <laughs> So, well, anyway, we're we're actually hitting about the hour mark. Is there anything you would like? I know there's so much we could talk about. Oh, there's so many we areas could. we could go into. I know, I know. And uh, so maybe next time we can uh, uh, have you back and we'll talk some more. But is there anything you'd like to say in closing to the folks that are out there listening? Uh, uh, something you want to tell them? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think, uh, you know, if you have any questions, uh, this radio pro or this Internet program is going to be a really good source for, for finding some of those answers. And... Uh, you know, I, I appreciate this opportunity to be here, Jeff. Well, I'm, I'm excited that you came, and uh, it just so happened I, I, I bumped into you one day, and I said, hey, would you like to listen or be a participant? And you said both. So, And uh, I, I've always wanted to ha hear a radio program like this, but I haven't. You can always hear a program of one particular side, two people right. talking about their side, and over here two people talking about their side, but never those two coming together mm -hmm. and talking together. So, yeah. Be so, it politics or religion or whatever, you can always time, find two people to agree, but it's really hard to find two people that are arguing civil, 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 civilly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's and that is so difficult to do, and I'll admit early in my walk, uh, I, I felt like I needed to, to beat it over people's head that I was right and you need to listen to me because I'm right. Uh, but now I'm to the point where I still think I'm right. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I feel the need to, to follow as Christ had done. Right. One of the things I noticed when Christ would teach, if somebody didn't believe what he said and they moved on, he didn't run after him and tackle him. Right. 
Right. He didn't run after him, jump and say, hold on a second, let me try a different thing yeah. here. Well, I went, when I was in, in college, and, uh, you know, there was a guy that was in, in all the hallways, and he'd be standing there wanting to pass back, pass out Bibles and always wanting to give you a hug and telling you, and walking down the hall in the loudest voice, oh, Jesus loves you and praise the Lord and all those things. And he was so annoying that nobody would listen to him. Nobody even wanted to be around him because he was so obnoxious about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't remember any scriptures talking about Jesus acting like that. No. And, he, you know, he was really offensive to a lot of people that maybe would have been willing to, to yeah. hear about it, but he was just so offensive about it. And, you know, we're not here in any way being offensive to one no. another. And I think that's yeah. is very Christ-like. But, uh, well, I, I heard somebody once say, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. Uh, one of the, the, the ministry, uh, uh, Salvation Army, when they had begun, I know people you know have issues with them now, but when they had started out, they had a motto. It was They said, suit, soap, and salvation in that order. They first wanted to take care of your physical needs before they took care of your spiritual needs. Right. And they took that model from the scriptures because they noticed that Jesus would heal and then he would teach. And... Uh, and there was another, um, well, that, that thought just ran right out of my head. But, um, but oh, it was it was St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, he said, everywhere, preach the gospel. But whenever necessary, speak. Use words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or use words. Yeah. So, yeah, so. Well, that's he, what I was meaning earlier about we're all missionaries. And a lot of that can just simply be by our behavior. I mean, yeah. my wife, when, when we met, she was a security guard and she knew members of the church that as they come through the guard area they just they were just nice they were just you know what then they you know she'd see them in their in the parking lot interacting with their family she's like look at this person what is different about them but they were just being a missionary with just their normal behavior yeah but she saw that from them yeah Damn. yeah and i know that there's always different theories on how to how to share your faith and how to talk and and i'll admit one of the reasons for doing this program is to try to figure out how the best way to share the gospel in a with humility and respect like the bible right, says absolutely. and i think that this is a way that we have areas of disagreement but we can also talk and and not beat the holy living tar out of each other because to let you know i would lose he's much bigger than me well he's not bigger than me i'm fatter and lazy <laughs> <laughs> i'm in it he actually does real heavy lifting you so. find a way to beat me you're smarter so <laughs> i'd sit on your face probably and just <laughs> wait till you choke <laughs> so anyway but Devin, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, this has been a really great uh, time. Uh, for those of the folks that want to listen to this show, if you're not listening to it right now, uh, go to godsproof.com slash Mars Hill, G-O-D-S-P-R-O-F dot com slash Mars Hill, M-A-R-S-H-I-L-L. Or you can actually go to my blog, which is Mars Hill GP, as, or, yeah, GP as in God's Proof, dot blogspot dot com. And uh, again, MarsHillGP.blogspot.com, and you can also check us out or like us on Facebook. Uh, it's Facebook.com/GodsProof. If you'd like to be a guest on this show, I'd love to have you on those uh, websites that I listed. And actually, we're recording audio, but I'm in post-production. I'm going to be putting up video, and you can go to the websites, and there's a web form that you can fill out and tell us about yourself, give us some contact information, uh, and saying that you would like to be. Uh, to, to come on to the show. Um, if I could, I'd like to leave with a passage of Scripture. This is 2 Peter 3 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that is my desire as well. So thank you. Thanks, Devin. Thanks for coming on. Uh, next, thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you coming. And next week, uh, I'm supposed to have a guest. Her name is Beth Perkheiser. She's an excellent musician, and she's also an atheist. Uh, and if you frequent my website, godsproof.com, down on the right, excuse me, left-hand side, there is an e-book. It's called uh, When Layman Debate, and it's the debate that I had with Beth through email. It's about a 150-page book. It's actually a big PDF file uh, that you can download and read, but she's going to be my guest next week. She's agreed to come on. So uh, just want to say thanks, uh, and God bless. Good night.